Two and a half years ago, Joan and I were trying to land a new client and really struggled to get the meeting. I finally get the meeting and I purposely made it for 3.30 in the afternoon when at the time Jonah was in high school, I knew he could be at the meeting. Now this is such a good opportunity for us to open up for case studies, research, a lot of speaking opportunities, some cool projects, I was so excited. So we land the meeting and I tell Jonah, okay, it's at 3.30, I'm coming from somewhere else, see you at the meeting, great. So I got to the meeting about 3.25, I walk in and I'm greeted by this lovely woman who says, oh, that Gen Z son of yours, he's so charming, so smart, you must love working with him. Now part of me was really happy that he had made it to the meeting, but I can't lie, I knew he was gonna give me a hard time for beating me to the meeting, so I was like, Ugh. So she walks me down to this conference room, walks in, true story, and I said, so where is Jonah? And literally she says, oh, he's joining us via Skype. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> and Look, there's a laptop on the table and Jonah's waving at me. Now, I am so mad right now. <laughs> Didn't say anything, we have the meeting, we get in the car and I'm still fuming about it and I call him and I was like, where were you? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, Jonah, you could have been at that meeting. It wasn't that big of a deal for you to make it downtown. He's like, dad, I was at the meeting and I thought it went great, but if you don't mind, I wanna talk to you about it later because I'm trying to get to the gym. So now I'm like really mad, okay? He says every single time we talk about this that he's over it. Clearly not because it comes up in every single speech. But <laughs> this is clearly a, a classic example of generational differences and I always like to know what the audience thinks. So as it was mentioned, we encourage you to use our phones. How often do you get to use your phones at a presentation? So to kick off today, we want to take a quick vote. Who do you think was right in this situation? If you think it was me, click A. If you think it was my dad, click B. To find this, you click on vote in our app, and there you will find your options. All right, how's it, how's it looking? Uh, give it a second, give it a second. That means I'm winning. Okay. Actually, right now it's pretty split. 53% of you say my dad was right. Wow. The other percent say that's pretty good for me. Usually I get blown out of the water on this one, but... Yeah, 53% of you said my dad was right. I'm just really curious, who in the audience picked me? Raise your hand, anyone, you can just shout. Why did you pick me over there? Yeah. Anyone, either one of you, why do you think, why did you pick me? Always be there in person at a client meeting if you should be. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, right there. You picked Jonah, why did you pick Jonah? Yeah, hold on, uh, before we Okay, so asking. she said, just so you, everyone can hear, hold on, that you thought Jonah was right because he obviously knew his audience and she really liked him. That's so he always says he's right, but I'm gonna ask a, another question to my dad. Yep. Did we get this client? <laughs> yes, we did get the client. And the underlining reason as right. to why we got the client was? They liked how high tech we were. Okay. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure, so, all right. If we're father and son, we live together, now we've been working together and we're struggling with this, we can't imagine what's really going on out there. So we get to travel the world meeting with leaders and again and again we're seeing little situations like this rise up and people aren't really sure why and suddenly they realize there has been a generational shift. And that's what we're here to talk to you today about as you recruit that younger workforce, all about Gen Z. But to get started, the most common starting places, take a look at who are the generations, and I'm gonna break it down for you here. We've got the traditionalist generation, born before 1946, population size of 75 million. Then came the great big baby boom generation, born between 1946 and 1964, population size 80 million. Then came Generation X, that's my generation, born between 65 and 79, much smaller, 60 million. And then of course we had the millennials, the children of the baby boomers, the most talked about generation in history, 1980 to 94, 82 million strong, stepping now into leadership, which is pretty cool. But we've got a whole new generation coming, Gen Z, born between 1995, 2012, the leading edge of Gen Z graduated college last spring at 72 million strong. Now, I did just break it down for you here by age, but we've gotta go a lot further than that. 
If you talk to a lot of generational experts, and this is my 21st year studying the generations, we might not all agree on the exact same birth years. Someone might say millennials start in 82, someone might say 79. Do not get hung up on birth years. Because the theory behind generational differences is that each generation lives through certain events and conditions that take place during their formative years, so between the ages of 12 and 20. And because they experience these events during those formative years, they adopt a generational personality, a certain lens that they look at the world that they then take with them into every single life stage. So if I talk to a baby boomer and they see images like this during their formative years, they remember, of course, Vietnam, JFK, Martin Luther King, the first television. Very different events that shaped that generation than compared to Gen X. My generation, of course, we had Michael Jackson, cable TV, the first video games, MTV came out. So we were looking through completely different lens but then again came a whole nother generation, the millennials, everything from Facebook to Harry Potter, of course, the tragedies of 9-11. And it's interesting that these events and conditions set a personality that you then take with you. So I'm just going to give you an example. Can you see a show of hands of my baby boomers who are willing to admit it? Any baby boomers in the room? OK, a baby boomer. Earliest memory of NASA and space exploration. What do you remember happening as a kid? John Glenn, the moon landing? No. The, oh, before the moon landing, OK. Went around the Earth. What's another big memory? Anyone else? Remember the moon landing? Most talk. So most boomers will say, I remember where I was, right? Remember where you were, what happened? It was exciting times. It's amazing what NASA could achieve. Government institutions should be upheld because they're creating these amazing opportunities for our country. OK, park that thought. Where's my Gen Xers in the room? Early memory of NASA, of space exploration in your formative years. That's right. I was in 11th grade. We have been studying the school teacher who went up in space. We all saw what happened play out before our eyes. And suddenly for Gen Xers, institutions were skeptical. Government spending, space exploration wasn't a good thing. Now that's just one event that took place in two different generations that resulted in a completely different outlook. Um, and so today what we really want to do is have you get your arms around Gen Z. Now what I do want to put out there is that by no means are we here to put anyone in a box. We're not here to stereotype. Does this apply to every single generation? No. But we have uncovered through 20 plus years and now studies on Gen Z that generational personalities do play out in recruiting and retaining the different workforce. Now, the nice thing about generations, it's no different than any other form of diversity, whether it be race, ethnicity, gender. We study all these to understand our employees. But when it comes to generations, there doesn't seem to be too much political correctness yet. So let me ask you a question. For an example, when I say millennials, what terms or thoughts come to people's mind? Anybody? Entitled, okay. <laughs> I think I heard that a bunch of All right, what'd you say? Self-serving, Self okay. <laughs> Flighty, all right. Millennials, feeling pretty good about yourselves, huh? Okay, I mean, we just put it out there and immediately it's entitled, we hear all these negative. Now, the nice thing, you put any other form of diversity up there, people don't talk. So the good thing about the generations is that we do get our thoughts out there, even if they're stereotypes or not. And so that's the nice thing about this topic. Yeah, my dad's right. Across the board, when we travel and speak to so many different leaders, people do not hold back when it comes to talking about generational differences. Now, something else that I've really come to learn is that when it comes to talking about millennials versus Gen Z, boomers versus Xers, people always go to the place of trying to figure out which generation is right, which one is wrong, who's better, who's worse. And we're here to tell you that that will get you nowhere. What you need to understand is that each generation is different. We've been shaped by different formative events. So naturally, we're going to have unique generational personalities. Now, unfortunately, another thing I've realized is that as we continue to travel, it shocks me how many leaders in the business world don't have my generation on their radar yet. Generation Z, we were born between the years 1995 and 2012. The leading edge are already in the workplace, and yet we're only starting to come into the conversation. Now, what most people assume is that they take, let's just say, the number 30. Anybody that's 30 and under, they clump us all into one group. And what most people do is say, you're just a millennial. And that really is the mistake to be made, because we are so different than the millennials. And if you assume we're a millennial, you'll only naturally treat us like them, and that will backfire. It actually happened before. When my generation showed up, Gen X in the mid-90s, people were not ready. Why? 80 million baby boomers had entered the workforce trying to figure out how do we stand out? How do we figure policies and procedures, rules and regulations to navigate such a big group? And we did. The challenge is everyone thought, oh, this works. Gen Xers will behave and think just like us. They tried to treat Xers like the boomers. And some of our most costly collisions, from communication to recruiting, retention, all because we didn't take the time to get to know this next generation. 
So the nice thing is, I mentioned the leading edge of Gen Z just graduated. You do get to be proactive. And congratulations to all of you for pioneering this dialogue. When we get calls in a few years, people will be in reactive mode because maybe recruiting numbers are down. But the leading edge is just coming in. Um, for our book, Gen Z at Work, that came out last March, we conducted three national studies on Gen Z, and we recently conducted the first global study on Gen Z's attitudes, and we identified seven key traits of Gen Z, and today we want to talk to you about three of them. So for our third study that we did, together we had the idea to see if anyone else was interested in this topic of Generation Z. So as a 17-year-old senior in high school, I started reaching out to business leaders, CEOs, celebrities, asking them to submit one question they had about Generation Z, and from Oprah to Mark Cuban, Seth Rogen, Ashton Kutcher, Mark Parker, we heard from everyone. Everyone wanted to know about Gen Z. So to kick off our exploration today, let's look at one of the questions we got from Christine Amanpour, who is an international chief correspondent. She asked, do you regard employment as an entitlement, or are you prepared to start at the bottom and work your way up? And across the board, we heard from Gen Z, 76% of Gen Zers said that they are willing to start at the bottom and work their way up. Now, I am convinced when I show an audience this, they're like, well, that's all I need to know. Just tell me how to find them, and we can move on to the break. <laughs> but it's really interesting, and it kicks off our first trait we want to talk to you about, and that is this is a very realistic and pragmatic generation. And there's a host of reasons this is, but this is a generation that knows it's going to be hard to get a job and to succeed at it. And one of the biggest influences on this has been the economy. If you take a look at millennials, they were raised during economic prosperity. Things were great. We saw businesses overnight exploding. Their parents were telling them they could be anything they wanted to be. And it was exciting times. You compare that to Gen Z, a lot of their dinner conversations were about companies trying to stay afloat, leaders being called into question, scary times, and not only out in the world, but right at home. During the recent recession, the net worth of their Gen X parents fell by 45%. So in a national study that has been asking teenagers, what are you most concerned about? It's been going on for years. So they asked millennials, what's your number one concern? And at the time, what they say? Am I popular? Even more specific, it was right when Facebook was launching. So they said, no, do I have a lot of friends on Facebook? Makes tons of sense for a teenager. That's what they were worried about. So then the survey was conducted 18 years later with Gen Z. And they said, Gen Z, what are you most concerned about? The number one answer, the economy. So in just one generation, we went from typical teenage things like, am I popular, to now we have a generation that was really worried about the economy and what it's going to take to get ahead. So a great and a really simple visual to help understand this key difference between the millennial generation and Gen Z is if you take something as simple as the entertainment industry. At a young age during their formative years, millennials were given Harry Potter, arguably one of the most successful book and movie series of all time. This amazing concept where teenagers could dream of escaping to this world where you had a wand, you told spells, there was a game, you flew around on brooms. What did us Gen Zers have? We had Hunger Games. <laughs> Post-apocalyptic, one versus the world, you don't win, you die. If you really sit down and think about it, it is an incredibly messed up concept, but yet weirdly entertaining. <laughs> Across the, board, across the board, my generation, Gen Z, we are in survival mode. We are really focused on what it'll take to get ahead in life. We are looking at different ways to survive and even thrive. And this survival mode mentality is especially true for those Gen Zers that are growing up in the poor or middle class. But our research shows that even affluent Gen Zers are very aware of the world we live in today. And, that, and they know that even after you go to college, you are definitely not guaranteed to have a job. Our parents didn't necessarily tell us that we could be the next president or an astronaut. They were very clear with our generation at a young age that this isn't such a pretty world and you've got to fight for what you want. It's interesting, I mean, you even said it right here, when millennials, and I wrote my book about the millennials in 2007, it was interesting, everyone said, God, this generation comes across as so entitled, so entitled. But in due fairness, we have to look at how they were raised, okay? When a millennial went to apply for a job, and if they got the job, what did their parents say? Oh my goodness, that company is so lucky to have you, right? <laughs> okay, and if they didn't get the job, what did their boomer parents say? Oh my God, they're idiots. They have no idea what they're missing. You know, another company will come along and they'll be much smarter. Our Gen X parents were saying, hey, you got a job, now don't go screw it up. <laughs> Very true. We are much more realistic with this generation. So this survival mentality is changing things. First and foremost, 
What are they looking for in a job? Now, I just told you, I wrote about the millennials. When millennials entered the workforce, the number one thing they wanted was meaning. Here's a generation that said, you know, I just, if I'm going to go work eight hours a day, I better be moving the needle on something, right? They also had baby boomer parents who were burning out at the time. And they said to their kids, look, if you're going to work as hard as I've worked, just promise me you're going to do something you really care about. That's awesome. The challenge was that millennials showed up at work, and from day one, they wanted to be Gandhi. And we're like, well, your job is to answer phones. I don't know. But like, they want to light the world on fire and do so many cool things. Now, what Gen X tells, Gen Z rather, tells us is, sure, they want meaning, like everybody, but I might find it a host of ways. I know I've got to work and I've got to earn in order to survive. And this came out loud and proud, truly, on our survey. We had Dave Gilboa, the founder and CEO of Warby Parker. He emailed us and he said, David and Jonah, what's the most important factor when choosing an employer for Gen Z? We ran the survey. <laughs> Top answer, pay and salary. Dara Khosrowshahi, CEO of Expedia and now um, Uber, he said, what are the top reasons Gen Z would stay at a company for more than five years? Top response, pay or salary. So clearly this generation wants meaning, but they're putting a premium on earning again. So pay and salary, top of the list. Now being in survival mode hasn't just opened up Gen Z at a young age to the importance of money. It's also making us question, what is the best path for me to be successful? The very traditional path, as everyone known, knows, has always been you go to college, you get a degree, and you get a job. And that's just how it's been done. However, for the first time in history, you have an entire group of kids challenging this. 75% of Gen Z said that they believe there's ways of getting a good education other than by going to college at all. Now, this can come down to a few different things, whether it's the DIY mentality, but at the end of the day, it comes back to money. We are terrified about drowning in college debt. 67% of Gen Zers indicated their top concern is being able to afford college. So how is that playing out? We now have a generation that says, well, if I'm going to go to college, I better know what I'm going to study. Now, that's very different, because you used to go to college to figure that out. You used to go to college to figure out your career. But now we have a generation where 61% of them said, I better know what career I want before I even go to college. So at a young age, they're trying to figure out what should I do with my life. Now, Jonah has an older sister. She's a junior at Miami of Ohio. And when I took her to look at schools, what did she say to me? She said, Dad. I want to be an eighth grade algebra teacher. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> and she's on her path to do that. But when I think about when I entered college, my first stated degree was forensics. I had a brief stint in medicine. And naturally, over four years, I got a degree in journalism. <laughs> That's just what you did. Me, how many extras out there took that path? You came in, exactly. We sort of found our way. It's interesting, though, but college right now, they're in trouble. A lot of higher ed, when they call, they're in reactive mode because the value proposition has really had to change. It used to be, come discover yourself, and we'll help you find your way. And we would go, and we'd spend the time. But now we have a generation, I'm only going to go if I know. As Gen Z applies to colleges, the new value proposition that's really connecting with us is the one that's saying, hey, you know what you want. We can get you there in X amount of time at this cost a very realistic statement in order to get us to go to college. Now, another thing that I've started to realize is that as we continue to travel and have these focus group with business leaders, and I ask them, you know, you're getting a lot of these new Gen Z recruits. Where are you getting them from? What did they study? And they have a blank face. They don't even know where they went to college. They don't know what degree they had. But something I do continue here is the importance of work experience. Leaders are now starting to hire people that have work experience instead of those important uh, higher ed degrees. Most companies are trying to get on Gen Z's radar. Now that they realize that we're the new recruits, we're the next employers, they're scrambling to figure out how to get on our radar. And the number one way you do that is still internships. It's a great way to introduce us to a brand and expose us to your work culture. But cutting edge companies are not just looking at college students for internships. They now know that if we know what we want to do before we go to college, they got to be on our radar before we go. So they're now trying to tap into the juniors and seniors in high schools, bringing them in for stretch assignments, special projects, field trips. They are really taking the time to get on our radar as early as possible. So many people will say to me, my god, an 18-year-old worried about what they want to be, and now they're trying to get professional experience. What happened to working at the grocery store? And it might be true. They might feel that this generation is growing up too fast, but it isn't all doom and gloom, because we have a generation that's willing to roll up their sleeves and work. As parents, though, Gen Xers, we have to own some of this. 
55% uh, of Gen Z high school students feel pressured by their parents to gain early professional experience. So the parents are saying, don't go work at the grocery store, go get professional experience. But like I said, it's not so bad. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and work. 